Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you will never miss an episode. Android users can find us and subscribe on your Play Music app. Apple users can find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Stitcher. You can follow us on Spreaker. And you can find the podcasts on jimmyhinton.org or findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so that we can spread the word. Let's get into the show. Welcome to this week's podcast here with Jimmy Hinton. And Jimmy's mom, Clara. Good to be back with you. We were off for a couple weeks. Um, We've been traveling to and from, and I think, Mom, you flew into Pittsburgh Airport just a few hours before I flew out of it, so we we missed each other, I think, by less than 24 hours. Uh, So I was in Ecuador for nine days, and, and then... Hintons are just world travelers. <laughs> uh, we left on, let's see, last Friday. We flew out of Ecuador. And that same day, uh, one of my brothers and his son, they were leading a team going flying to Haiti. Um, so we were flying on the way back I from Ecuador, and they were flying to, yeah. to Haiti. So, yep, yep we're, we're all over. I don't even remember where you were. I was in Nashville. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, Enjoying the Nashville heat. Yep, we're just uh, we're traveling all over the place, but we are back in the saddle. It's good to be back. Um, so we wanted to talk today, uh, and probably for the next few weeks, about some of the long term effects um, that survivors feel, and how that fits into the grand scheme of. Um, uh, I guess God's will, um, God's plan, uh, where the church is God's going. Family. Yeah. And, you know, instead of this being a depressing thing, uh, because we hear a lot of negativity as survivors, as advocates, you know, we, we know the evil that people are capable of. Um, but we wanted to focus instead on some of the good things that are happening and, um, you know, offer hope because, uh, as, as Christians, uh, we believe, you know, we believe in hope. We believe that, uh, there's hope not only once we die and, and, and see the other side, but, but there's hope right now. There's hope this side of eternity. And people need to know that and people need to hear that and be reminded of that. Because it's easy to get swallowed up in the depressing, dark stuff, especially when the church, who should be helping people, is instead hurting people. And I think, Jimmy, you and I, in in talking previous to this podcast, um, mentioned that we, excuse me, we are the church. We, each one of us, are the church. And we often do get sucked up into the whole, the depressing hole of all of this abuse and the negativity that goes with it. And we can get into the mindset, well, there is no hope. There is no good. There is no church. Mm -hmm. Um, But there is good. There is hope. There is God's church is active and alive today. And we need to grasp hold of that hope and become part of that light of hope. Yeah, and one of my one of my former not former one of my current elders um, is a former police officer, and he he repeatedly reminds me not to get stuck in or pulled into uh, the darkness uh, from all the bad that I see. And he said, I, I'm telling you, as somebody who was an officer on the streets, um, there were times, periods of times where he felt that there were no good people out there. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, he, even though in the back of his mind he knew that that wasn't true, um, he just saw 
just horrible thing after horrible thing. And, and all the calls are, are to go in and to find the bad guys and to catch the bad guys. And, and he saw what they were capable of. And, and he said, it really hardens you. And you tend to forget that there are good people out there. And, and it's I like, you can't think, lose focus of that. Right. I think that's so critically important in relationship to God and the church and our place here on earth. We don't ever want to get to a point in our lives where we fail to see the good, where we fail to see God, where we fail to see hope, mm -hmm. um, where we fail to see God active in our lives and the, in the lives of others. When we get to that awful place, that's when we lose our grip with God. We lose our connection and we don't want to go there at all, ever. No, ever. Not, you know, I think it's really important um, just to be aware and, and to know that there are good, good, good Christians out there. There are good Christian leaders out there. Right. There are good churches out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, organized religion is not, that's not the culprit. Um, the culprit is people who become hardened or prideful or selfish. And, you know, we certainly need to call those people out. And I have no problem doing that. Oh, we know that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the reverse of that is that not all religious leaders are bad. Not all churches are bad. Not all organized religion is bad. Um, and so equally as important as calling out sinful people, prideful people, people who do so much damage to survivors and churches who protect abusers at the expense of the abused, equally as important as calling those people out and those churches out is to highlight the, the churches that are getting it right. And, and to, to let people know, to let survivors know that you guys hold a really important key to be in the hands and the feet of Jesus. Um, and, you know, you don't necessarily have to be part of organized religion to do that. Uh, I think there's always strength in numbers, but nevertheless, uh, even if you're at a place where you can't physically step inside of a church building, and I, completely empathize with that uh you can still be the church we can still pray and change people's to God. lives we can still um have a servant heart we can still um help the wounded and i think um people who have been wounded know what that feels like they know that pain they mm -hmm. carry it and who better to tend to someone else's needs than a person who understands truly on a personal level. Yeah, when you say that, I, I I thought right off the bat of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And it, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you go back and read that, you'll find the word comfort over and over and over and over again. And it's the highest concentration of that word back to back. Um, it's, it's the most repetition of the word comfort out of any book in the entire Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul says, you know, if um, if we're distraught, uh, it's for your comfort. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort. You know, it's this selfless um, offering comfort to other people. And, and never does he say, well, we're being comforted for, for our own good, for our own health. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul says no matter what we experience, whether we experience comfort that other people give us in desperate times, or whether we experience heartache and tragedy and, and horrible things, all of that is for your comfort. All of that is to reach out to other right. people Absolutely. and to comfort them. Absolutely. And to give them hope. Yes. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think as survivors, you know, you guys are all especially positioned to be able to offer comfort, even if you don't feel comfort right now. Right. Um, and you can't, I don't think we can overstate the importance of that. That sometimes, I, I think what 
you know, we talked about this in a previous episode, but I think what we've become so accustomed to as Americans is the super size me religion where we're enticed by uh, this um, this greasy, gross, feed me up and fill my belly now type of Christianity where it tastes it tastes good and you're drawn to it because of all the garbage that they put in it, like all the salt and all the stuff that they, they do to make these nasty, greasy cheeseburgers palatable. Oh, and, and then it, they do taste good. And, yeah, come well, on. they do, but then Initially, after, after you consume them, you're like, and you feel what horrible. have I just done? Yeah. And you feel I gross agree. and you feel you oh. just so nasty because yes. your, your body's trying to process this thing mm-hmm. that shouldn't belong in your stomach. Right. And I feel like we've become so accustomed to that that we're like, man, if I'm not if I'm not feeling this thing right now in the moment, then maybe it's it's not true Christianity. Mm-hmm. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I know there are a lot of days where I feel just completely depleted. I don't feel uh, you know. I either feel drained mm-hmm. and depressed, or I don't <laughs> feel anything. And, you know, I sometimes I have to stop and say, well, let me take a step back. Let me take a breath and let me look at what God's doing. And, and, and you have to consciously do that because if you're waiting on this feel-good feeling as an expression of what God is doing in your life and in the lives of other people, sometimes you're not going to get that. So it's important to remember that... Um, Christianity is not about all the feel goods and it's not about um, filling your cup and getting something out of the, the worship service and even getting something out of the relationships with, uh, with your fellow Christians. Uh, Christianity most often is about just emptying yourself and serving other people. And that, that doesn't really feel good. <laughs> you know, I was it feels say that word serving is so important. Yeah. And um, when we are wounded, probably the last thing we feel like doing is serving because we do feel so depleted. We feel empty and we do need picked up. We do need filled. But often we get filled by serving others, which seems strange, but that's how it works within God's family. Uh, When I serve you, meaning whoever, no matter how empty I'm feeling at the end of the day, I feel full after I've completed, you know, something in uh, of helping, in other words, of service to somebody else. And we lose sight of that sometimes when we get angry with God, we get angry with all God's people. And when we're just tired and depleted and drained. Totally exhausted. Replenishment is definitely needed. Yeah. Definitely for the wounded. Absolutely. Well, I think, I think a lot of the times questions that not just survivors of abuse, but just people who are struggling, I, I, I think the question in those deepest moments of despair is what do I have to offer other people? I, I'm just trying to, to heal myself. What in the world do I have to offer other people? And I think the resounding answer to that is empathy, compassion. You have lots to (laughs) offer other people. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the very fact that you're experiencing heartache and grief and tragedy, um, you you need to lament that, um, you know, and we, sh- we should have the freedom to be able to lament and to be able to cry out and to detest the bad things that are going on in our lives. And, you know, so often Christians don't really want to hear that. The religious leaders especially don't want to hear that. And I think that's why um, survivors often hear the the platitudes that they hear like well why don't you just forgive and move on why don't you uh, you know this happened x amount of years ago why don't you just uh, move on from that why are you still hanging on to that mm-hmm. i think that's because the religious leaders end up being uncomfortable sitting with p- 
people who are uncomfortable. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But again, the flip side of that is that there are genuinely good, good people out there. Uh, there are good religious leaders out there who really do get it and who are the hands and the feet of Jesus. And, you know, I can share a couple of stories from Ecuador that uh, just last week that really impacted me because I didn't really know what, what to expect whenever we got there. Um, that was my first time there. And we have uh, missionaries who are good friends of my wife and I. And, you know, they've been there for, I don't know, seven years now. And our church supports them financially. And we we just haven't had the money to be able to take a group right. there and go visit them because it's very expensive. Um, so we finally raised the money and we decided it was time to go down. And when we went down there, that they kept me really busy with um, doing workshops and things like that on child abuse. And part of that is because um, Rusty, who I'm, I'm good friends with, the missionary, um, he's had to deal with some really bad cases of child abuse. Um, and, you know, he'll call me and, and I'll consult with him. And he asked me to come down and for me specifically to talk to different churches and different groups uh, and to train them while I was down there. And I said, well, I'm, I'm here to serve. Wherever you tell me to go, that's where I'm going to go. And the first place I went to was um, one of their church plants. It was a town about 20 miles or 20 minutes rather away. And it was in the evening. Um, this was four hours long. And I was speaking through a translator. Wow. It was a, a friend of mine who I went to seminary with, who was my translator. And, you know, you can imagine showing up on a weekend um, in the evening. And there were probably, I don't know, 30, 30 or 40 people who came wow. out, which I thought was wow. really impressive. I think it is, Jimmy. Um, the preacher from the congregation him and his wife were incredibly kind and gracious and and nice. And there were no cases of abuse um, that that church is aware of. So they didn't invite me to come speak because they were dealing with the aftermath of abuse. They invited me to speak there because they genuinely wanted to learn how to be a safer church. Okay. That always encouraged mm-hmm. me when I get called to go somewhere and there's not a reason for them to call me mm-hmm. to come. That gives me incredible right. encouragement. Absolutely. Because that means yeah. that they're taking the initiative um, and they don't have a reason to do it. There's not a, you know, they're not Just because dealing they with the aftermath of abuse. Right. Right. Yeah, they genuinely want to learn. Right. So, you know, I spoke at this congregation and at the end we did a question and answer. And immediately, just based on the questions and the nature of the questions you could tell who the survivors were in that audience. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that opened up all kinds of dialogue for me to come back and say, you know, this church needs to create an atmosphere where these people who are talking out right now for the first time ever, Mm -hmm. they need to feel safe Mm -hmm. to speak up to the leadership here. Right. Um, I bumped into that preacher a few days later at the camp uh, where we were staying. He showed up for, for, I didn't even know that he was coming, but this preacher showed up and the first thing he did, um, he came up, didn't speak any English, and he came up and he gave me this big hug and he just looked me in the eyes and he said, he said, gracias mi hermano. Thank you, my brother. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That gives me incredible encouragement and hope. Um, there are good, good people out there who really get it. Right. Um, I'm just kind of sitting here listening to you talk about Ecuador, churches in Ecuador. We often here in the States don't even think beyond the States, beyond the perimeters of, of the We don't US. even think beyond our local and, church. Right. We, we become so self-centered. Right. We, we just... 
lose sight of the fact that there are people struggling with abuse all over the world. Mm -hmm. There are ministers of God struggling to deal with this abuse Mm -hmm. with, with people within their churches all over the world. How humbling for me as your mother to think that God is using you in Ecuador now to help with the healing of uh, victims of abuse. Well, and I have no doubt in my mind that that church, um, they've already taken changes and they're, you know, uh, they've taken measures to minister to the survivors within the congregation. And I, and I received word back uh, before we left Ecuador that each of the places that I spoke at, they've already taken um, pretty dramatic, uh, dramatic rather measures um to make to make changes, like how, I gave, how, I give recommendations right, for each right. of the places. So I always give recommendations mm-hmm. based on the information that I receive. I'll come back and I'll say, okay, well, you know, here are my recommendations. Doesn't mean that this is what you need to do, right? But just thinking out loud, these are my recommendations. Um, one of the places that that I went to, I did a facility walkthrough of uh, a school, and um, you know the the principal. And I'm not sure what, what his wife's role is, but that, you know, basically the principal and his wife, they run this school. Mm -hmm. And I was really impressed with the safety measures that they already had in place there. But as I walk through, and this is always the case, when I walk through, I will find vulnerabilities. Um, Because I walk through as if I'm an abuser and abusers exploit vulnerabilities. So, you know, even if a place thinks that they're the Fort Knox of, of, of churches or schools or whatever they are, I guarantee you I'll find vulnerabilities within seconds. Mm -hmm. I'll find vulnerabilities. I know you will. So we are walking through and just to give you an example, um, uh, she said, um, well, here's, here's a door that, you know, we always keep this locked and she turned the handle and she pushes the door and she goes, it's supposed to be locked. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, and, you know, yeah. there were several times mm-hmm. where that was the case. And I said, you know, it's interesting because we become so comfortable knowing that there's a secure place yeah. within our facility that we don't double check it. And so somewhere along the line, somebody had opened, uh, unlocked this door mm-hmm that's supposed to be locked all the time. They don't even use this one door that goes outside. It was, it was unlocked. Somebody knows it's unlocked. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's that sort of thing, but, uh, you know, I gave a list of recommendations for the school and the very next day, um, I received word that both her and her husband called down to the camp and said, we want to, you know, pass word on to Jimmy. We wanted to thank him. Um, here are the changes that we already made at the school. So I'm talking within just hours, a little over 12 hours. hours. Yeah, hours. They yeah. implemented pretty dramatic changes at this school to tighten up their mm-hmm. security. And that's the kind of thing that gives me incredible hope. That's wonderful. Um, um, very positive, very encouraging. How beautiful it is that you were used even uh, within the other group that you talked about, to open dialogue about abuse Mm -hmm. of those who have never spoken about their abuse. How healing is that? How, you know, how wonderful is that? Um, We need to hear more of this type of thing so that we don't fall into that, um, those deep waters of despair, depression, Mm -hmm. darkness, where we feel like, God is so distant. The people of God are so marred and so evil that goodness no longer exists. So we need to continually encourage one another with stories of hope like this. Yeah, and those ripple effects are never ending. You know, we we talk about the ripple effects of abuse, um, but the opposite of that is that the ripple effects of just being yourself, just sharing your story, just talking. Um, just caring, just expressing empathy and compassion, um, those ripple effects are equally, if not more powerful, 
than the ripple effects of these horrific abusers and their enablers. Right. Um, and your I, I ripple think, effects are never ending of, right. you know, for our listeners, every good, kind, compassionate act that you do, I guarantee you has ripple effects that will come back to you. Absolutely, positively. And I think something that we lose sight of often is when you share your story and another shares their story and another shares their story, there's hope within Mm -hmm. that chain of sharing. Mm -hmm. Because as I see a person, there's a survivor who is alive and thriving. Here's another Mm -hmm. survivor who is alive and full of courage. Here's another survivor who is full of love and care. That's hope. And Mm -hmm. that's connecting the dots and forming just a sea of hope. Well, and it's pretty cool too, like seeing how, how connected the, the kingdom of God is. And, you know, here's another cool example. I didn't even tell you about this, but, um, a year ago, Last month, I was uh, at a fairly small, I'd say small, medium church down in Texas, and they had invited me. Um, I couldn't even remember how I was invited there because this was another church where there was no known case of abuse within the church. Okay. But mm-hmm. they invited me. Somebody from that church invited me, and I didn't know anybody there. Mm-hmm. Um, they invited me to come down and to to do a couple-day workshop. So I had done that, and lo and behold, right before we go to Ecuador, I find out that there were people from that church who were going um, at the same week as us. They were going to be there in Ecuador. Wow! So we get there, and there were all kinds of people there who I knew, who I had just met a year ago. And, of course, you know, we got to know each other when I was down there, and one couple, a wonderful, wonderful couple – uh, they had taken me out to eat down there in Texas. And so, you know, we got to be friends. And, you know, so here are all these people who I knew and had this relationship with. And um, now, of course, Natalie, my wife, she looked at me and she's like, can we not go anywhere in the <laughs> world where you don't I know people? Say, even in Ecuador, Jimmy, um, really? So, really? <laughs> so it was it was wow. really cool to get to serve mm-hmm. shoulder to shoulder with people who I met just a year ago. And one of one of the ladies who um who's from that church, she came up to me and um this was towards the end of the week, and she said, I just want to thank you for going out to uh to these different churches and organizations here in Ecuador and speaking about abuse. And she's like you know, the impact that, that you had when you were in Texas, um, we're still feeling that. And, and then she started, she started to tear up and she said, and by the way, if you need a survivor of abuse to publicly share her story, if that would help you, um, I'm here. Wow. And I thought that like, that's the kind of thing that I thought Mm -hmm. that's what the church looks like. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, and, right. and that's, that's happening mm-hmm. right now. Um, it's wonderful. And, and it's a beautiful it thing. Is. It really is. Yeah. And so it's, you know, one person being connected to another and, you know, we all have, uh, we all share pain mm-hmm. and that's something that you, you had taught me a long time ago. You said, there's one thing that all of us share in this world. There's one commonality that links every single human being and that's grief. It is. All of us yeah. experience grief. We do. Yep. Um, and I, I think it's really neat to get to see and to have experienced that in Ecuador um, where we're all just working shoulder to shoulder and we're blessing people in the community and we're helping people. And word got back to us pretty quickly that one of the, one of the people who um, – some of our team had helped out in the community. Um, I forget what the project was, but you know, f- for us, projects didn't matter. Like that was just tell us where to pick up a shovel or where to grab a paintbrush or where to speak or whatever. Yeah. Your so, you know, that t- yeah. to us, yeah. like the physical labor was just 
meaningless work. Um, what we were there for was to make connections with people and, and to make new friends and to, to love people and to share our stories with people. And so this gentleman who was a professing atheist, um, he came to, to uh, one of the people who lives in Ecuador and one of the missionaries. And he said, I just want you to know that never in my life have I experienced such compassion in, in a group where I didn't feel like I was a project to them. He's like, these people were here and they, they lost track of whatever the project would paint. I think that was a painting project, but, but this gentleman said they completely lost track of that and would just sit down and talk with me because they just wanted to be my friend. They like, they genuinely cared about me and who I was. Issues of the heart. They were dealing with issues of the yeah. heart. And that's, yeah. and, and he said, yeah. I, you know, I still am a professing atheist, but, there's also something deep inside of me where I'm starting to question whether there could be a God because of what I just experienced. I love that. Yeah. I truly love that. I really do. And, you know, it is my hope and prayer that we can share more and more and more stories of that because I think as wounded people, we do lose sight that there still is good Mm-hmm. in this world that God still is very much alive within the hearts and lives of many, many people. So yeah, people thank are being you for transformed. sharing that. Thank yeah. you so much. That that was needed, Jimmy. Thank you. So we'll leave you with the truth bomb today and, and I would just say, you know, for those of you who are discouraged, for those of you who are struggling or um, you're just flat out broken, um, don't lose hope and and continue to be the church continue to be the hands and the feet of Jesus bless one person today Uh, just go out and share your pain with somebody uh, with somebody who will listen that's all you need to do and God will do the rest Um, know that there are good people out there there is so much hope Uh, and there's hope right now That's our truth bomb. We thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you next episode. Thanks again for listening to today's episode of the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker, subscribe on Google Play Music, Apple Podcasts, or Stitcher. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.